Uh, whoops, wrong tape. Rivers, the super highways of America's oceans. We live in an aquatic age, a utopia of freedom on the fjords. These homegrown innovations represent only 7% of our nation's landmass, yet transport the goods, services, and coal mine tailings our modern industries desperately need. With exciting new effluvians being invented every day, our underfunded river system just can't keep up with our growing greatness. Lou Trine, regional manager for the River Folk Company, is a world famous. We. You heard it here first, folks. America needs more rivers. Call your representative today and demand they replace our aging infrastructure with the thoroughfares of the future. The River Folk Company is the most social faction in route. Designed around the notion of selling services to your opponents, success with this faction rides on your ability to convince the other players that supporting you is their best interest. This reliance on the generosity of our enemies not only makes the Otters one of the game's most engaging factions to play, but it's also their biggest Achilles heel. In fact, even a simple Google search exposes just how large and pendulous this... It means what? The Otters have 15 warriors, which is respectable. We start with only four of them on the board, which is mid. We take all of our actions through funds, meaning that our action economy is virtually uncapped. We draw cards as a daylight action, giving us the best card economy in the entire game. We ignore rule whenever we're moving along the river, and we're arguably the best crafting faction in the entire game. Lastly, our trading posts are a major source of victory points that opponents can't actually stop us from placing. On the downsides, however, we depend on these other factions using our services in a way that benefits us. Half of our warrior supply is going to be in our funds box for most of the game, we have maybe the most expensive recruiting of any faction. We have a large gap between the VP on our faction board and the VP that we'll need in order to win. Advanced setup nerfed the river folk harder than any other faction. And lastly, our services are frequently part of an opponent's win condition and there's not really much we can do to stop that. Here's the plan. In the broadest possible strokes, the Otter game plan is thus. We make as many early sales as we possibly can, holding onto those warriors as long as we're able. We use the early game to draw cards and craft as many things as we can get away with. We place our trading posts only one at a time, using our own funds, and only when we need it to craft something we drew. We use the garrison warriors from those trade posts to accumulate a death ball of otters that we'll need for rule and battle. We make our way to 18 to 20 points, using as few funds as we can get away with. We avoid getting ourselves killed or forced into policing someone else. And once we've reached the end game, we dump all those foreign funds to place as many unblockable trading posts as we can, hopefully reaching 30 points in the process. Since they form such an integral part of our strategy, let's talk about those funds for a moment. Just like in real life, the biggest thing standing between us and our hopes and dreams is money. Sadly, us rugged individualists don't get to be born with 30 points. We're otters, not Elon Musk rats. We have to earn that shit. Our success depends on how efficiently we can convert our funds into points. Because they're reusable, the value of each fund actually decreases with time, since you have fewer turns to make use of those funds. We'll need to spend funds to craft and amass warriors, but the longer we can hold onto those funds before doing so, the more value we'll get out of them overall. Holding onto foreign warriors in our funds both limits our opponent's board presence and is an effective form of passive policing. Picture the charismatic Eerie turmoiling early because they're missing three warriors, or a mole player who's been flooding you who now has no warriors left to rule or build. Now, on the topic of holding on to foreign funds as long as we can, I'd like to talk about Stingy Otters. Stingy Otters refers to the approach of taking whatever funds you're given at the beginning of the game and keeping them forever. Stinginess brings guaranteed access to funds, better agency by not depending on your opponents, and more passive policing by virtue of holding on to their shit longer. Friendliness, or making and keeping quid pro quo agreements with your opponents, 
means propping up other table threats to drive counter purchases, getting more use out of the foreign funds that you're given, and building more positive table relationships overall. I, personally, am a proponent of stinginess. Friendliness is not an equal agreement, especially in a competitive game. It's a prisoner's dilemma where the only winner is the first person who reneges on their deal. Now, I will absolutely agree that making deals and interacting with opponents is the major draw of playing otters, but holding on to the funds is simply better for you in a competitive context. I don't regret lying to all of you with that other thing there, and I know that. Even with completely trustworthy opponents, there will inevitably come a point where one of you must renege on your deal in order to preserve your chances of winning the game. Save yourselves the time and just kidnap that shit turn one. If you're spending the funds that you're given each turn, then your action economy is never increasing. Hoarding the funds nets you more funds each turn from protectionism. By spending those foreign funds to recruit or place trade posts, you're giving up other options by returning those warriors. Things that you could use on actions, card draw, and crafting. These lost opportunities are a more efficient use of your funds, and relying on them for these agreements can leave you lacking in the end game. No matter what your approach, people really only benefit from a limited number of purchases in any given game. More often than not, people asking for their funds back have already finished shopping. If you've been playing the Otters for any length of time, you may be aware that they used to be pretty high on the tier list. I say used to, because they're one of the only factions that actually got worse with the release of Advanced Setup. Under basic setup, everyone at the table started with three random cards after having chosen their faction. If your hand sucked for your faction, buying from the Otters was the only way to fix it in time. Under advanced setup, however, everyone gets to pick three cards from a set of five. Since there's only 54 cards in the deck, the table now gets to see just about 40% of the deck before the game has even begun. I still think that ad set is better for everyone overall, but when you're playing as otters it makes milling the deck in the first few turns even more important while dividend plays are quite a bit worse. While we're on the topic of funds, let's talk about the services we'll be selling in order to generate them. Our cards are the number one way we're going to make sales in every game. People generally only care about cards. Your goal as an otter player is to have a handful of craftables and ambushes as often as you're able. If your hand looks really good, setting prices at 3 will force your opponents to choose between them accelerating your economy or leaving you to craft all those cards and gain all those points. Choosing whether to craft all those good cards or keep them to yourself for a turn is an important distinction. A strong riverfolk hand presents an unspoken threat. If you don't buy, someone else might. In spite of the obvious versatility, people pretty much never buy riverboats. There simply aren't that many situations where using the river is more advantageous than taking a normal turn. Most often, opponents will only buy riverboats if they need to escape from a corner or if they're going to win the game on that turn. Mercenaries is our most complex and divisive ability. It allows other players to use your warriors for battle and rule during daylight. This daylight restriction means that lizards will never really be able to use this, no matter how desperately they may want to. For us as the otters, mercenaries is a promising prospect on paper only. Let's imagine that your otter ball is sitting on an enemy clearing, with mercenaries priced at 3. You gain 3 funds, take out some enemy cardboard, and save yourself some actions if someone were to buy. Sounds like a pretty good deal, right? The problem lies in just how quickly your losses can and will exceed the funds that you've gained. If the defender has an ambush, your patron certainly isn't going to play one of theirs to spare you from losing three or more otters in the first battle alone. No, your patron wants you to lose warriors. They've just weakened two of their opponents at the same time for a lower cost than if they'd done the fighting themselves. In fact, when playing as any other faction, mercenaries is my preferred way to police otters. You just wait until they sit on a strong opponent, buy mercenaries, and spend your turn wiping out the whole clearing. In most games, I personally price mercs at 4 and leave it there the entire game. However, so long as you understand the risks involved, you're free to price it however you like. You can only go wrong if someone actually calls you out. In spite of this risk, there are ways to get out ahead when using mercenaries, and they all rely on correctly calculating the value of your funds against what you stand to lose.
One situation I've found where mercenaries can actually shine is when one of your opponents needs policing. Despite the appearance of our many actions and warriors, we never want to police on behalf of the table. Spending all those actions to move and losing our warriors in battle is a cost that we rarely ever will recoup. However, if we're nearing the end game and we're no longer as dependent on our warriors, mercenaries can be an ideal situation. Spend your turn farming all the points you can via crafting and otter fund trade posts, then end your turn sitting your otter ball on top of the policing target without battling. Your opponents then need to buy mercenaries from you in order to police the target, spending their actions to do so while also feeding you multiple funds that you can use to close out the game. Lastly, I'd like to address the strategy colloquially known as cat tax here, because mercenaries is involved. The cat tax strategy involves sitting on someone else's stuff in the very early turns of the game and blackmailing that player into buying mercenaries if they want to proceed with their normal setup. The cat tax moniker, of course, comes from the fact that you usually see this done against a Marquise player's sawmills. I personally do not advocate for this approach. Least of all because I'm a relentless cat apologist and this is a bit of a dick move. A cat player who pays the cat tax is giving you a huge material advantage that will only make their own life worse in the long run. But a cat player who responds by destroying your starting warriors will put you in a huge material deficit, while you've just eliminated one of your best customers. This approach also exposes you to the risk of someone else buying mercenaries in order to cripple both of you. Welcome to Riverfolk Company Marketing 101. Before we begin, if the prospect of proactively convincing people to buy your services makes you uncomfortable, then I can assure you there's nothing to worry about. You see, just like anything else in life, nothing you say or do will ever, ever matter. Ever. The first and most valuable thing you can do is simply remind people you exist each turn. I personally like to end my turns by announcing what cards I have in my hand as well as their current prices. I also like to draw random garbage in Tabletop Simulator and do other goofy bullshit that comes to mind to draw attention to myself at the start of every turn. A lot of otter players will tend to coerce people with empty statements like, Ooh, wouldn't it be nice to have this bird ambush? But nobody really cares unless they were already planning to buy it. The better way to go about it is to put in the work to actually identify a valuable course of action that card enables them to take and suggest that instead. Something like, if I may make a suggestion, you could buy this bird ambush at two, which allows you to fight the four moles here in this clearing without needing to recruit or move. Then if you aren't ambushed, but you roll badly, you could spend the bird ambush for an action to finish the job. Concrete suggestions like this with measurable benefits make a much stronger impression on people's judgment, and they compare much more favorably to the warriors they'll lose in payment. As a counterpoint to this, sometimes opponents will approach you with offers like, well, I'd buy that car if you drop your prices first. These opponents are full of shit. If your prices actually mattered in their decision making, they wouldn't be discussing the prospect at all. This principle applies to you as well, telling people things like, I'll go police the leader if you buy from me, isn't fooling anyone. An experienced opponent is able to calculate both the cost-benefit ratio of their card purchases, as well as the needs of your turn based on the board state. It should come as no surprise to you that our best maps are the ones where the river has the most impact. Winter and Mountain are prime examples of this, with Mountain also providing us the opportunity for easy points from the tower and passes. While the lake map may seem good for us, the raft acts as competition for our services, dampening our overall income. The best place for our starting warriors is probably whichever river clearing we can use for crafting that won't get us killed right away. You probably already know what a good starting hand will look like for the otters, but while you're drafting that hand, there's no reason you shouldn't be negotiating with your opponents as to which cards you should keep. Your hand is public, even during your setup steps, and this includes all five cards you draw in advanced setup. See which cards people might be interested in buying from you and tailor your hand accordingly. The last step in our setup is setting our prices, and it's important to know that the price we set for our services, either here or through the rest of the game, sends a specific message. Right at the beginning of the game is just about the only time that setting your prices at 1 is actually worthwhile. Literally any purchases we get before our first turn is pure profit. 
This is why we are one of the only factions that enjoys being last in turn order, because we can then optimize the number of first turn purchases. The one exception to this idea is the Vagabond in your game. Because they exhaust items to buy, the Vagabond normally has to skip turn actions if they want to buy something on their next turn. On turn 1, however, the Vagabond has three items they can use to buy that will get refreshed before their turn even begins. It costs them literally nothing to buy at 3. So if you have a hand of cards that you rather didn't fall into your opponent's hands, like coins or swap meat, a starting price of 3 is frequently a good call. Or set a price of 4 and try and prevent people from buying them at all. Contrary to other factions, we don't really have an engine to build on the first couple of turns, and our funds will never be more valuable to us than they are on this first turn. For your first turn as otters, you can't go wrong by committing all of your funds just to draw cards. Not only does this fill up our hands so we can make the best use of our most important service, but it also starts building the card advantage our faction can leverage like no one else. Any of you who've played Magic the Gathering already know, if you're touching more cards than your opponent, you're more likely to put your hands on the cards you need to win. Taking all of the best cards so that no one else can have them is our faction's greatest strength, as it fuels our scoring, pressures people into buying those cards, and denies those cards from our opponents. With our first turn out of the way, the question we have to answer for ourselves for the rest of the game is what kind of advantage we want to be building. There's two leading schools of thought here. The first and most reliable approach is to keep leveraging our card advantage. Focusing on our card advantage like this is reliable. It drives opponents to buy from us, even if they're intentionally avoiding it, by virtue of the fact that we hold all of the valuable cards, or we've already put them in the discard. It is a rational, dare I say, competitive strategy. Except for the fact that you need to actually draw those good cards in order for this to actually work. Now let's say that you're more of a risk taker. An angel investor who doesn't need critical thinking because they have vision. Well, you can try our second offering, dividends. Anytime we start our turn with at least one trade post on the map and warriors in our funds box, we are given one victory point for every two warriors we have in there. It's practically free real estate. If we're going to make dividends work as a strategy, however, then we want to use it when people lack the resources to actually punish us for it. Ideally, we start with our opponents making a purchase or two. Then we place a trade post on our starting otters so that we have five defenders guarding our only post. We use the odd numbered fund we have to draw cards. Then we just keep skipping our turn, farming sweet, sweet points. The moment that anyone at the table then says anything like, we've got to do something about these otters. It's time to stop farming dividends and play like a normal human being. Depending on who you are, you may probably have a different opinion on whether using dividends is worthwhile in your games. The ability to gain points for doing literally nothing is pretty appealing. So you might be asking, why is it that dividends is so unpopular? Trade disruption. We can avoid trade disruption 90% of the time just by committing all of our funds each turn, and that way we never need to worry about protecting our trade posts. The number one way that trade disruption happens is a situation like this. Imagine your opponents have been fighting, and there's some tasty, unprotected cardboard on the other side of the map. It's not worth trudging over there for it, so you drop a trade post and fight with the warrior there, right? You fool. You absolute moron. You were given but a single petard and you chose to be hoist upon it. Now you're getting ambushed, and you're about to lose not only half your funds, but half your entire goddamned turn. Financially or emotionally, you will never recover. If you absolutely have to put a trade post at risk like this, make sure that your battle is the last action you take this turn so that your funds are not at risk. There's one other problem with dividends, though. Even if you do succeed at farming up to 10 or so points from dividends, you've sacrificed all the actions and card advantage you could have gained by taking normal turns. It's been a few turns. You and your friends have reached about 10 points, the board has filled up with warriors and cardboard, and purchasers from your opponents are but a distant memory. This is how you know you've officially entered the mid-game. This is the most challenging phase of the game for us. With protectionism as our only source of income, there's no safety net if we overspend or need to replace our warriors. 
Our goal as the Riverfolk Company is to cross the 20 victory point threshold while holding on to about three to four trade posts left uncrafted and as many funds as we can save. In fact, one of the defining features of an otter mid game is having to avoid the many pitfalls we can be run into. The first of these is the trap of otters as table police. Spending our entire turn moving and fighting someone to then end up spending half our funds replacing warriors is a bad deal, and opponents will never pay you enough to make it worthwhile. Traipsing across the map to police someone is the number one way otter players lose games they could otherwise have won. Our next threat is runaway opponents who might be outcrafting you. Crafting is a major part of our win condition, and we can't let someone else beat us to it. If someone else is threatening to get ahead of you, or is crafting more than you are, breaking their kneecaps as early as possible is perhaps the best and only time you should be policing anyone. Another threat is wasting actions. Move, recruit, these do not score us points. These are not words we understand. You should be planning your movement carefully so you do as little of it as possible. Finding ourselves trapped away from the river is one of the most devastating situations we can be in. If we get overruled away from the river, it's going to cost us big time in actions and warriors to make our way back. Next, some players will happily flood you with their funds because they know they can outrace you in points, especially if they know you won't be able to convert their funds into valuable trade posts. Whenever you see this, you need to react quickly to these situations, because you won't be able to place TPs using your own funds as normal. Use the surplus funds that you're given to mill the deck, or to recruit and destroy your generous patron if they're getting ahead of you. The most competitive players know that Riverfolk's greatest weakness is their warriors, and they will force you into recruiting as a means to get their funds back. The easiest solution to this is to avoid players who've been overfeeding you without flooding, but if this isn't possible, then take the initiative from them first, and weaken their position before they can do the same to yours. Newer players who've been burned by the Riverfolk in prior games often resort to perhaps the most direct and simple form of Riverfolk counterplay. Just don't lie. The choice of refusing to interact with us is disproportionately effective for how easy it is. We need purchases in order to compete. This begs the question, in a truly competitive game, how much should our opponents be buying? The answer is a lot more than you would think. Let's picture a four-player game. If the table is united to starve out the otters, they've successfully eliminated one player from victory contention at no cost to themselves. Now let's picture the same situation, but one of those opponents is willing to break the anti-otter compact. Every card they purchase furthers their own advantage, while also propelling the otters as a threat the table now has to solve. You actually eliminate two players from contention by choosing to buy from the otters. For us as Riverfolk players though, it's important to know that refusing to buy is a prisoner's dilemma. If even one player is clever enough to break the pact for their own benefit, it makes it far more likely the other players will have to buy as well. The secret of optimal card purchases is this. If somebody other than you or the otters won, you weren't buying enough. Lastly, while there's not a lot of ways to get more funds in the mid-game, there is one method that dares not speak its name. And that's because... Export bad. When people argue about rebalancing the game, they like to bring up things they feel could use improvements. Things like embedded agents, the Vagabond quest deck, fear of the faithful, cats. Export is the one feature so uniquely terrible that people literally forget it exists when they are discussing balance changes. In brief, if you ever find yourself crafting a card, you could instead choose to just throw that card away. In exchange for this decision, you get to place one warrior into your payments box, meaning that you're immediately cancelling protectionism. One warrior, regardless of how expensive that card was to craft. If otters represent the influence of corporations in the woodland, then export represents an investment in cryptocurrency that your uncle told you about. The one case where export does have a use is dealing with opponents who are flooding you. If you know they're going to make another purchase, you could export some otter funds into your payments box first. This might be the only time export has value, ever. But if you are some kind of lunatic, trying to break new ground on forbidden strategies, 
Perhaps you could try exporting once per turn and leave your car prices at one for the rest of the game. Who knows, maybe those purchases will work out somehow. You've held on to your funds as best you can, and you've made it past 20 points. This means that you've finally reached the end game. The very first thing you should do once anyone at the table reaches 18 to 20 points is set all of your prices at 4 and leave them there for the rest of the game. One of our greatest weaknesses is that we can't prevent someone from winning on the backs of our services outright, but we can make it as difficult as possible with high prices and an empty hand. Next, the end game is where we are no longer as reliant on placing trade posts using our own funds. As a result, we no longer need to be as defensive of our warriors and can fight all we like without having to worry about repercussions. 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 In the worst case, we can always recruit the bare minimum number of warriors we need for trade posts in battle. Lastly, we then proceed to our secret weapon. Like a Walmart on Black Friday, our trading posts are powerful and dangerous in equal measure. And just like Walmart, they're the insidious, festering rot that will bring about the end of all civilization. If you reach the end game with a good number of foreign funds in tow, then you can rest easy, because these funds allow you to place a trade post in someone else's clearing, and there's nothing they can do to stop it. This unilateral power enables the otters to win games without having so much as a single piece on the board, and our opponents know and fear it. The ideal otter end game involves spending all of our remaining funds to jump from 20 straight to 30 using trading posts and crafting, while watching as our opponents' souls vacate their impotent bodies. Now, it wouldn't be a corporate presentation without at least one dry, boring PowerPoint. Yes, this is a recreation of a real slide I was once forced to endure. Yep, it's time for our matchups and card preferences. Cats, lizards, and moles are our best customers. Birds, rats, crows, vagabond, and keepers are okay, but they don't buy that often. Expect the Woodland Alliance to never buy. In fact, the Woodland Alliance with their limited number of funds shouldn't ever buy from us, and if they do, you should never return them. Birds and rats are the two factions that will fight us the most, and lizards will be pretty willing to convert us if given the chance. If you find that someone like moles or lizards are flooding you, then it's your job to punish them. Bombs and sympathy are a major threat if we ignore them, but we draw our cards in daylight, which means that we can expose plots pretty much for free. The ability to go around the map like this, guessing corvid plots, can farm us from points, but it's not as efficient as just playing normally. More importantly, bullying Root's Horse Faction is kind of a dick move. And if you make a habit out of it, you'll learn very soon that those crow players are just as capable of bombing you before your first turn even begins. Lastly, we get to our all-important cards, and there's not too much to be said. When it comes to craftables, we want all of them. End of story. Propaganda Bureau, Master Engravers, Coffins, Sabos, and Planners are our S-tier cards. Each one of these either strengthens our existing game plan or solves a major weakness of our faction. Command Warren, Cobbler, Yuri Emigre, and League of Adventurous Mice give us more actions, which is always great, especially when those actions are free. Sappers, Armors, Partisans, and Ambushes make us an unappealing target, which is good, especially when people have to pay us to remove those defenses. Betterborough Bank, Charm Offensive, Tax Collector, and Boat Builders are all cards that compete with our services. We want to prevent people from having these in the long run, but it's never really worth using these cards ourselves. Marine Brokers, Sand and Deliver, Swap Meet, and False Orders are all cards that we don't want to get hit by, or we definitely don't want people to have. When it comes to Swap Meet especially, Otters are disproportionately targeted because opponents know when there's something worth stealing in our hand. Favor cards... We're one of the factions that has the best chance of crafting these, but it still takes us quite a while before we get there. That said, nothing says forced to purchase at four, like a favor in your hand and two matching trade posts. Informants, tunnels, and boat builders are three cards that we are literally, mechanically incapable of using if we craft them. It's still funny to do it, though. And that, my buzzword-addled brethren, is the Riverfolk Company. A faction that's seen its share of boom and bust, but which still holds promise for those bold enough to play it. So for all you aspiring Riverfolk mains out there, 
It doesn't matter whether your market is bull, bear, otter, or twonk. To me, you are all twash. I'd like to thank you all for watching, and until next time, be good to each other.